perception that Jimmy Carter is a wonderful former president and a nice guy, but a failed president. And Mondale goes on to say that that is all wrong. Kai Bird is the latest to take a fresh look at the Carter presidency. Kai is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian and journalist. He's the author of a number of books, including The Color of Truth, the McGeorge Bundy and William Bundy Brothers in Arms, The Chairman, John J. McCloy and the Making of the American Establishment, Crossing Mandelbaum Gate, Coming of Age Between the Arabs and Israelis in 1956 to 1978, the Good Spy, The Life and Death of Robert Ames. Ames perished in April 18, 1983, truck bombing of the American Embassy in Beirut. And the American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer with co-author Martin J. Sherwin, which won the 2006 Pulitzer Prize for biography or autobiography. His latest book, which we're gonna talk about tonight, The Outlier, The Unfinished Presidency of Jimmy Carter is a rich and human story of Jimmy Carter marked by both formidable accomplishments and painful political adversity. Author and historian Douglas Brinkley calls the outlier a profound clear eyed evaluation of a leader whose legacy has been deeply misunderstood. For tonight's conversation with Kai, we are fortunate to have Joe Crispino. Joe is the Jimmy Carter Professor of History at Emory University. He's an expert in the political and cultural history of the 20th century uh, United States and of the history of the American South since Reconstruction. Joe is also the author of three books. His most recent book, Atticus Finch, to bi biography, Harper Lee, Her Father and the Making of an American Icon. So welcome to both Kai and Joe, and a reminder to our audience to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we will get to those a little bit later. Joe? Thank you so much, Carrie. I do want to encourage everyone to chime in with their questions. I've got some questions for Kai, but we are eager to have your participation. Kai, welcome virtually to Atlanta and to the Carter Library. It's, I know it's a kind of homecoming for you. You spent a lot of time here at the library and doing your research for this book. And it's a wonderful book. I've really enjoyed uh, reading it. I know a lot about the Carter, President Carter's life and his presidency. I've taught uh, seminars on his presidency four or five times, but there were many, many things that I did not know that I learned from, from your book and from your research. So thank you for this, for this work. And I'm really excited about talking with you about it. Well, thank you for having me. Well, you've written a, biographies about a variety of fascinating figures. Uh, uh, Carrie talked about some of them, Robert Ames, McGeorge Bundy, William Bundy, most notably uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the book that you won the Pulitzer for. But what attracted you to Jimmy Carter as a biogra biographical subject? Well, um, back in 1990, you know, literally more than 30 years ago now, uh, I was just finishing my bio first biography that took me 10 years to write on John J. McCloy. And in that book, I had to write uh, a long chapter really about the Iran hostage crisis, which of course involved Jimmy Carter's presidency. And that was my sort of first introduction to writing about him. And I got curious about his presidency in particular. And um, you know, I, I, it, the thought occurred to me in 1990 that uh, it might be fun to try to do a presidential biography. And I explored the whole issue uh, by doing a magazine piece on uh, what Jimmy Carter was doing with his ex-presidency, particularly the Carter Center, was, which was just opening up in 1990 and getting started. So I flew down to Atlanta and spent two weeks interviewing a bunch of his uh, new aides at the Carter Center, and I had a brief telephone interview with him. But I, I wrote the piece, and it was a nice cover story in the, mag, in the Nation magazine about all the wonderful things that Carter was doing. Uh, but I came away from the experience thinking that I was actually the wrong guy to do a, a biography of Carter. I didn't understand the South. Uh, I didn't understand Southern Baptists. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand race and the role it played in the South. Uh, and 
I also learned that Carter's archives were still pretty much closed. You know, it was only 10 years after he left the White House. And so most, most of his papers were still classified. Um, so I backed off from the idea, but it, it, you know, I was still curious about Carter. I went on to other projects. And then in 2015, I sat down and wrote a proposal. And I was still ignorant, I think, about the South and all those other issues, but I was still curious and I wanted to learn. And, you know, you write a book to try to satisfy your own curiosity in the first instance. I, I sold the proposal in 2015. And then just a few weeks later, Carter had that incredible press conference where he announced that he had brain cancer and was probably not gonna be with us very much longer. So I thought I'd never get a chance to interview him. But as we all know, he survived. And I did get um, a chance to have four or five good interviews. And uh, six years later, I, I have, <clears throat> have produced the book. Yeah, well, talking about those interviews, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you mentioned the prologue, you had access to President Carter to interview him. I wonder, uh, what was it like interviewing President Carter compared to interview subjects or other historical figures that you've interviewed for your other, um, for your other biographies, other works? Uh, well, you know, he was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> because he's a busy guy, even in his 90s. And uh, he would give me exactly 45 minutes yeah. for each session. And uh, he'd then look at his watch and, and uh, sharp on the dot at 45, 45 minutes, he would, uh, his secretary would knock on the door and, and I would be escorted out. So I had to be fast and furious with my questions and try to cover a lot of ground. But, you know, he was, he was focused on his, his good works, his work on, on the Carter Center and bringing peace to the Middle East and wiping out guinea worm disease. And, and uh, you know, he wasn't much interested in answering familiar questions. But mm -hmm. I remember I, I, I'd like to tell this story. In my very first interview, uh, I was, I had the wisdom or, for, or, or uh, good, good chance to sort of ask him about Charlie Kerbo, his personal mm -hmm. lawyer, who uh, everyone was describing to me as the Atticus Finch of the Carter administration. So as the, the author of a book about <laughs> Atticus Finch, <laughs> I think you know what that means. Yeah. I mean, Kerbo was an incredible figure um, and pretty unknown. But he wrote uh, many, many hundreds of pages of letters and memos to Carter before his presidency, but during the White House years. And I pointed out to Carter in that very first interview that uh, Kerbo's papers weren't there, they were missing. And uh, he expressed surprise, those bright blue eyes sort of lit up and he turned to his aide, Steve Hockman and said, well, we gotta find those. And indeed, three days later, I got a phone call from Steve Hockman, who said, well, we've located them in the attic, the attic of Kerbo's widow. And there are five boxes, cardboard boxes, I believe, of these memos. And this was a major breakthrough for me because eventually I was given access six months later to these papers. And they form a, a real you know, spine for my my narrative, particularly of Carter's, the odyssey of his political career, his first run for governor, um, and, and even in the White House years, because Kerbo was his closest advisor, his closest sort of friend in many ways. And uh, it was a sort of a, a window into Jimmy Carter's mind to be able to read these memos that Kerbo was writing for the president. I agree. In fact, I wanted to ask you about one of my questions was about the Kerbo papers. It was a tremendous fine and it does provide a, a sort of spine, as you say, for the book. And it's really fresh material. And I wondered, as you came to those material uh, and was reading those documents, what most surprised you about um, about Kerbo's influence on Carter? What, what did we not know? 
Or what did you not know? And what do we not know about? I mean, we know that he's the long time. We know that he first helped Carter on that 62 campaign that was contested. That's right. what they met. But I was surprised myself at how, because Kerbo didn't go to Washington, you kind of assume that his influence ebbs uh, on Carter, but it doesn't really. He still continues to play a very influential role, even though Kerbo himself didn't go to Washington. I wonder, I wonder, I was, as I was reading that, I was wondering why didn't Kerbo go to Washington? And what would you say is the influence that he continued to have even when Carter was in the White House? No, oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, Kerbo refused to go to, the, to Washington. He was offered by Carter the position of chief of staff. Um, he was the only person offered that position. Uh, and when Ker Kerbo said, no, I, I, I want to remain in Atlanta, I can't afford to move to Washington, <laughs> was his line, <laughs> which was sort of a little suspicious since he was, uh, you know, fairly well off, powerful Atlanta lawyer with Keith. although that was very true of Burt Lance Burt Lance shouldn't have moved to Washington <laughs> well exactly and and later on Kerbo actually uh said you know Burt Lance would have been better off if he had followed my my advice and not moved to Washington but no Kerbo was interesting to me because uh the surprising thing was he he helped to explain to me Carter's political um, orientation. You know, he, Carter is sort of an enigma as a, as a politician and president. Uh, liberals can't figure him out. Conservatives can't figure him out. He, he has different positions and, and, uh, and he's sort of hard to categorize. But Kerbo, it's, it's clear when you read the memos, Kerbo is himself a, in that great historical tradition of being a southern populist, he's he's uh, you know he's from South Georgia, uh, from working class as such origins, uh, but and he has a suspicion of big business, and this is also Carter's view, and uh, you know he he believes that tax the taxes should be very progressive and that government should be working for the common man and he's suspicious of big corporations and big government <clears throat> and this explained a lot to me about carter kerbo had a lot of influence before as you said from 62 on but even during the white house years i tell one funny story in the book about kerbo he uh you know he would generally fly up to Washington every two or three weeks, um, and particularly when there was a crisis, so that he could just be in the White House for a few days and wander around, and quietly observe what was happening. And then he would have a one-on-one -on -one with, with Carter and tell him what he, he thought. And uh, so one day Carter is apparently in the residence upstairs of, of the White House having a, a session with a group of journalists, a group of thirsty journalists. <laughs> but remember famously Carter moved into the White House and announced that he was no, not going to serve hard liquor. So he had served these thirsty journalists, you know, iced tea. <laughs> so at one point, suddenly the door opens and Kerbo wanders in and Jimmy, you know, who was kind of bored with this session, he, his eyes lit, lit up and, and he yelled to Kerbo, Charlie, come on in and help yourself to a bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he made an exception for Kerbo. Yeah. Well, one of the things you pointed out that I did not realize was that part of the, the, the reason why the Carters didn't serve hard alcohol is because it cost so much. It was a it was a financial decision less than a kind of puritanical religious reasons. I mean, they drank exactly you know, alcohol themselves and would and have wine with, in different situations. But it cost a lot because the presidents themselves were, you know, had to pay that tab. And it gets back to that point we were making about Kerbo not going because he didn't have enough money to go to Washington. It does seem like, you know, 
um, you're reminded that it costs money to go and, and it, to do public service. And unfortunately, oh, yeah. it's oftentimes the, only the wealthy who are able to afford it to, to, to do that work. Um, but uh, let's see, the, one of the things I wanted to ask you about too um, involved uh, uh, kind of President Carter's uh, rhetorical style. Um, for any leader, you know, uh, how they communicate is enormously important to their, to their leadership. And you have an interesting quote from President Carter's son, Jack, in which he says that his father is not an orator, but when he speaks with moral intensity, he makes you believe it. And I think that was very true of, say, his Malay, quote unquote, Malay speech, and also probably his Law Day speech, which is so extraordinary, which you talk about in the book. What did you learn about in your research about President Carter's rhetorical style? Well, you're right. You characterize it right on the mark. He was very good, you know, campaigning, you know, in 70, 75, 76, when he was in a small setting, a living room a uh, church uh, at where he could speak sort of off the cuff to people. Uh, he would uh, connect with people. He could go into a, you know, a black church and feel just perfectly comfortable because of course he had been raised in Archer just two miles down the road from Plains where he was just about the only little white boy and he, he, his playmates were African-Americans. Uh, so he was very comfortable in black churches, but he was very comfortable in small groups. He wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't uh, a, a good orator on, on the stump in a big audience. And he was, he was probably weakest in front of a television camera. <laughs> so, uh, but he on the other hand, he was very good on in front of a television camera when he was in a press conference answering questions from reporters. He could be witty and, and uh, entertaining and, and substantive and persuasive, uh, but he just wasn't an orator in that way. But you're right to refer to the Law Day speech in Atlanta in 1974, which was a significant speech because of two things. It was the first time he met Ted Kennedy who he thought was going to be his rival in 76. And it was the first time the gonzo journalist Hunter Thompson encountered Carter. And Thompson was blown away by Carter's speech that day, which was an extemporaneous speech. He had thrown away his speech notes and he made this, this sermon. It was a sermon where he talked about Southern justice and how lawyers had uh, not served the people by, you know, <clears throat> not representing the poor and giving them equal justice. And it was a passionate speech and uh, Hunter Thompson became a, a Carter advocate at that point. Yeah, I love to, to go back to that speech and to teach that speech. It's a very timely speech because it's really, it is a sermon about injustices of the criminal justice system. And it's remarkably, you know, uh, timely in our own moment when we're doing, going through this reappraisal of, of race and criminal justice in, in contemporary America. But right. the closing in that speech too is, is a remarkable when he reflects on uh, ha having read War and Peace as an 11 year old. I don't know what 11 year old <laughs> reads War and Peace, <laughs> you know, uh, but it's a it's a remarkable speech, you know. Um, this is the first ever kind of cradle to grave biography. There have been books about President Carter before, but yours is the first to kind of deal with the whole life. It's interesting that twenty two of the twenty seven chapters I counted were about the presidency himself, the presidency itself. Uh, which it seemed to me there was an implicit argument in that decision as a biographer to spend so much time on the presidency. I mean, it was, I think we forget, I mean, as, as Kerry said in the opening, we think about President Carter as a great post-presidency, but a lot happened in, in his presidency. So what did you, what did you find uh, to be some of the accomplishments of Carter, you know, as the, as president that, that we forget? 
Well, I should say that, you know, Jonathan Alter's book last year was also a cradle to, well, a full yeah. biography. Yes, but true. he he focused less on the presidency in comparison to my book. You're right. I, I my book is heavily weighted to towards the White House years. And I, uh, initially I started out thinking I was only going to do the White House years. But when I started to write, I just I couldn't stop writing the preface and it grew and grew because I realized I had to explain where this guy came from and South Georgia and Plains and that whole story was just a key to explaining his the his politics and and his presidency but yes the I I think the Carter presidency is particularly relevant today in the wake of the failed Trump presidency and uh as we see Joe Biden uh, occupy the White House, there are many lessons learned that Biden could learn from the Carter presidency. Um, and coming back to your opening comment, uh, you know, the perception is that Carter was, at, was a failed president, but actually he was a very consequential president. He passed more legislation than Bill Clinton or even Barack Obama. Uh, or the Bushes, uh, you know, he was only there for four years, but he deregulated natural gas, he gave us seat belts and airbags, he deregulated the airline industry, which allowed middle class Americans to fly for the first time in an affordable way. Uh, he ex greatly expanded the food stamp program, bringing three million new working class people, largely African Americans in the South, giving them access to food stamps. Uh, you know, he, he did a lot on the domestic agenda, but he, he, his accomplishments in foreign policy are just uh, remarkable. You know, the Panama Canal Treaty, SALT II, the arms control negotiations. Uh, China normalization, immigration reform, and of course, he put human rights at the center of uh, American foreign policy for the first time as a key lodestone. And, you know, his successors haven't been able to walk back from any of this. And of course, he also focused heavily on the Middle East and trying to bring peace to is, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And, uh, you know, he was he was not afraid to take on really tough issues. So it's it, it's a remarkable record. It is a remarkable record. Uh, one, it reminds me of um, something in the book that you talked about the, the remarkable relationship that Jimmy and Rosalind Carter had. I mean, that in some ways they didn't have friends. I mean, they were so close as a, as a couple that <laughs> right. they didn't really have a broader social set. They had their family and they had their this marriage where they were just full partners. And you have great material on Rosalind and, and all the things that she did and sitting on the side on the wall in the cabinet meetings and taking notes, you know, and, <laughs> and, and people being upset about that, not knowing how to handle that. But uh, but Rosalind Carter, uh, uh, in your telling had a kind of political instinct that maybe her husband didn't. Uh, she was she was telling him, you know, maybe don't do this, wait, wait for this the second term. And it was interesting to hear her political counsel. And I wonder if you think if anybody could get through to him about those things, it would have been her. And, and yet even she wasn't able to kind of get him to, you know, consider the political implications of trying to do everything at once, you know, that. Right. I wonder if you're yeah. able to make, how, how, how do you explain that? Well, it's, you know, she's, she's a very interesting personality. You know, she never finished college. She was extremely shy when Carter began his political career uh, to the point that if she had to give a speech, it made her quite nauseous. Uh, but by the time he entered the Oval Office, she had become one of the best campaigners on the road. Uh, she could go in and give a talk to any kind of crowd. And she could all, she also was sent out by Carter on meet the press when 
he was in the Oval Office, he, he would send her to talk to these reporters on, on this great television show that reached millions of people. And she was articulate and persuasive. And yeah, but she had the political instincts that Carter wanted to ignore. And this is again, one of the paradoxes about Jimmy Carter. He was, uh, <clears throat> you know, he could be ruthless on the campaign trail. He knew how to win political power. He knew what was necessary, what he'd have to do to appeal to certain voters. And he could calculate, make that calculation and uh, because he wanted, he was ambitious and he wanted to, to win the governorship in Georgia. He wanted to, and then the presidency. But once he was in those positions of power, it was his religiosity that kicked in and he believed that he was obligated. It was his responsibility to not do the politically expedient thing, to not consider the politics, but to figure out what was the right thing to do, what was the intelligent thing to do, and to do it regardless of the political costs. So he decided early on that the Panama Canal Treaty was something that had to be done. And it came at great political cost. He persuaded uh, you know, the US Senate to pass it by a very narrow margin. And seven of those senators who were up for reelection in the next election two years later lost their seats. Mm -hmm. And partly due to, be, to their votes on the Panama Canal Treaty. So again and again, he paid a tremendous political cost. And poor Rosie, as he refers to her, uh, could see this and she at one point says, you know, Jimmy, don't you want a second term? <laughs> and you know, she could see that he 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 was uh, in trouble before he could even see it. But yeah, it was fascinating your portrait of that marriage. Um, I'm going to ask a bit of a nerdy historian question, but I think it's an important insight that you have that historians need to wrestle with. So <laughs> historians in the United States who write about the shift in the global economy since the 1970s and the rise of kind of market fund market fundamentalism that underlies, you know, what scholars call neoliberalism. They often point to the democratic presidency of Jimmy Carter as one of, you know, Carter's one of the originators of neoliberalism. You know, it's not just the arch conservative Reagan, they point out, who valorized markets or pillared big government. You know, and it's true that Carter was responsible for a number of deregulation efforts, some of which you've talked about, you know, the airline and trucking industry and craft brewing industry, which I had not realized, which I can appreciate as a consumer of many craft brews myself. <laughs> right. But in your book, you make a really interesting point that in the case of airline deregulation, it was actually the business roundtable that opposed deregulation because they saw it as what you described as, quote, a radical consumer agenda. So I thought that was a fascinating context. Tell us more about Carter's, quote unquote, radical consumer agenda in the, the mid-1970s, late 1970s and how that might provide a different context for understanding his embrace of, of deregulation. Well, he, interestingly enough, you know, just, before, just after he won the Democratic nomination, he uh, retired to Plains and to take a break. And he invited a bunch of people down to give him advice. One of them was Ralph Nader. And, and uh, they played baseball to get together. Ralph Nader was assigned in his black suit to play the role of umpire. <laughs> anyway, they they had uh, they, they broke bread together, and Nader became enamored with Carter because he was apparently completely open to taking his advice on who to appoint to various positions in the government. Uh, you know, he he for instance, got Joan Claybrook and put, put her in uh, as director of the Auto Safety Board. And, uh, you know, Ralph Nader, of course, was famous for his, his first book on the dangers of, of the automobile. And Joan Claybrook, you know, was the woman who pushed through seat belts and airbags. And, and you know, so Carter, and she wasn't the only 
Dr. Naderite who was appointed. There were literally dozens of them. And his whole point was that he wanted to, as a um, as president, he wanted to use his office in, in the interest to, to, to protect consumers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this cut both ways. So you talk about airline deregulation, you know, th this helped consumers. It allowed middle-class Americans to travel, but it also uh, disrupted big business and the airline industry opening up the big carriers to competition. So the business roundtable was initially opposed to it. It also alienated la labor unions because it, it made it difficult for the airline, the unions that represented airline workers to, uh, to keep their monopoly on power as such. So it, it was a populist, pro-consumer administration that undercut some of the core constituencies of the liberal democratic base, trade unions. Right. <laughs> so this is the, the paradox, uh, another paradox of the Carter presidency. Yeah, it's interesting. I thought it was interesting too, how you take to task in this book, some of your fellow journalists. You have a really interesting chapter, uh, for example, involving Carter's former speechwriter, James Fallows, who published, you know, a blistering expose of the Carter administration that did a lot of political damage to Carter. And you're pretty critical, I thought, of Fallows' decision to publish that piece and his characterization of Carter in that piece. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that, but also more generally, did Carter get a fair shake from the press, do you think? Well, he did not get a fair shake. He uh, became president in early 77, you know, just in the wake of the Watergate scandal where every journalist in Washington wanted to emulate Bob Woodward and, and Bernstein uh, and, you know, become known as uh, an investigative journalist. So they went out trying to find dirt on the Carter administration uh, very unsuccessfully. But uh, it was also a time when the Washington Post was inventing the style section. And uh, so this, you had journalists who were going like Sally Quinn, who were writing very gossipy pieces about Hamilton Jordan and Jody Powell and the Georgia boys surrounding the, the Carter uh, White House, who she would make fun of for their Southern accent, the way they dressed, the way they they talked about issues, the fact that they weren't interested in the Georgetown set. They didn't circulate on the cocktail circuit. Uh, and Carter himself, you know, uh, Sally Quinn was very critical of Carter uh, for turning down dinner invitations from Catherine uh, Graham, the publisher of the Washington Post. And, you know, Carter just didn't, he, as you said, he, he would rather spend time with Rosie in the White House in a quiet dinner than go out and shake hands and talk to uh, a bunch of rich folk from Georgetown. Uh, <clears throat> so he got a bad shake from the, the media in general. Um, and you mentioned James Fallows, who was a very young man in his 20s. Uh, for two years, the first two years of the administration, he was the chief speechwriter. Uh, but his real ambition was to uh, break into magazine journalism. And after two years, he left. And his very pe first piece as a staff writer for The Atlantic was a long, long expose as such entitled The Passionless Presidency. And it was a sort of psychological investigation of Jimmy Carter and uh, rather thin in my opinion, <laughs> but it, it did, as you say, it did real damage uh, to the Carter presidency at a moment in 1979 when he was facing long gas lines and a lot of criticism over many issues. And it sort of, that piece gave a green light to the rest of the press that it was, it was okay to, dump on the Carter presidency.
that there was yeah. something wrong, Fallows suggested. And, you know, Jody Powell and Hamilton Jordan and Carter himself regarded this article as a stab in the back, a betrayal from a one-time insider. Uh, but it's a colorful story and, uh, you know, James Fallows made some some good points about some of the failings of the Carter presidency, his, uh, his, uh, his <clears throat> problems with giving a speech in front of a TV camera. Uh, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. this, you know, it was, I, in my view, it was an unfair attack. <laughs> you, well, you, you have that uh, point that you make about, it's remarkable, and this is just interesting as a, as a kind of study of, of rhetoric and writing and how people what what people remember, but the story that that Fallows tells there is the story about Carter scheduling the White House tennis courts, which you point out is not true, but but it, it gets reported, and that becomes uh, the emblem, the emblematic story that people go on to tell even to this day about Carter as a micromanager and not seeing the forest for the trees and. And having to have his hand in everything it's um but that story wasn't true was it no it was a, a result of a misunderstanding on the part of fallows who uh was an avid tennis player and president carter was the first president to sort of open up the white house tennis court to staff um so yeah, and allowing them to use it uh, it was you know his instinct to allow his, his staff to have one of those perks, why not? Well, one day he goes down to the tennis court with one of his sons to play a, a game and uh, the court is occupied. I'm not sure if it was Fallows or someone else, but uh, it was occupied. And instead of kicking them off the court, Jimmy Carter just turned around and walked back to the Oval Office and casually mentioned to his secretary, Susan Clow, well, why don't we have a sign-up sheet <laughs> for the tennis court? And so it was Clow who maintained the sign-up sheet, but uh, Fallows you know, would occasionally write draft speeches and send them in to Carter, and he'd uh, attach a note saying, Mr. President, can I use the tennis court at 3 p.m.? <laughs> and uh, he would get an answer from Clow or sometimes from Carter, but it, it wasn't that Carter was managing the tennis court schedule. Anyway, it, it was yeah. a, a unfortunate misunderstanding, but you're right. You know, this is one of the stories that uh, everyone remembers about the Carter presidency, that he paid so much attention to detail that he was even managing the tennis court. Now, in fact, you know, he was a, a, a detail oriented president. He read 300, 200, 300 pages of memos every day. And you can see that in the archives he, because he has scribbled in the margins of these memos, his comments, often quite funny or acerbic. Uh, he was a great reader and that's how he took his information. He worked very hard. I think he was the hardest working president we've had in the 20th century and probably, you know, one of the most intelligent and without a doubt the most decent but here he's because of the tennis court story he is <laughs> saddled with this notion that he is just a engineer an engineer's mm -hmm. mind paying attention to the tiniest detail well to me the most telling thing about the tennis court story is that is that we, when it was occupied by staffers he'd just turn around and go back he wouldn't kick them off the court yeah. you know, which you imagine most presidents would do exactly <laughs> it speaks to his egalitarian kind of sensibility and that you know it's just if it's if it's crowded i'll go do something else um so the classic standoff in the carter foreign policy shop is between Brzezinski and Vance. Tim Naftali wrote in the New York Times review of your book that just came out over the weekend that he thought you sided too often with Vance in your assessments. And I wonder how do you respond to Professor Naftali? Uh, what, you know, one, do you think that's a fair characterization? Or, or, uh, and if it is, why did you make that choice? Well, it's true. If you, you read my book, you'll come away with a strong understanding that Zbigniew Brzezinski, the National Security Advisor, 
was uh, constantly nagging Carter to have a tougher foreign policy. Brzezinski saw the world through his aristocratic Polish eyes and he just hated the Russians. And he believed the Soviet Union was uh, an evil empire, <laughs> to use Ronald Reagan's term, and that we were in a generational, multi-generational conflict. And he, he viewed every foreign policy issue through that prism, uh, that Cold War prism. And so he was constantly, you can see in the archive, he, he's telling Carter you know, to be tougher, uh, do something militaristic, uh, say something nasty about the Russians, uh, use, use some, send a signal by using a little force. And in one of these memos, uh, you can see in the margin, Carter scribbles, oh, use force, like Mayaguez, mm -hmm. a reference to Henry Kissinger and President Ford's disastrous use of force in Cambodia where that led to unnecessary deaths of, of hostages that had been taken aboard a ship. And, uh, you know, Carter repeated, what was astonishing to me was that Carter repeatedly turned down and rejected Zbigniew's advice, particularly during the first three years. He just, uh, you know, he had a different attitude about the Cold War and about the Third World in particular. He didn't think that the Soviets were behind every little revolution in the Third World. And uh, he took Brzezinski with a large grain of salt. And he more often sided with the worldview of Cy Vance. And, but the, the mystery is why did he put up with Zbig if he disagreed with him so often? And, uh, you know, he, I asked him this in one of my interviews and he said, oh, you know, Zbig entertained me. He was witty, he had a hundred ideas every day and you know, I'd have to reject 98 of them, but he would be uh, an entertaining conversationalist on an airplane, a long airplane ride. They had numerous arguments. And I remember when I interviewed Brzezinski, he, he himself told this story. He says, well, I had a really vociferous argument one day in the Oval Office with Carter. I left, went back to my office, and a few minutes later, Susan Cloud, the president's secretary, comes in and hands me very formally a green envelope. Now, the green envelope is stationary, signifying a handwritten instruction from the president. <laughs> and so he knew it was something from Jimmy Carter. He opens the envelope, and there Carter says, Zbig do you ever know when to stop? <laughs> now, Brzezinski was proud of this note. <laughs> he thought it was like signified his, his, the nature of his uh, access to the president. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was this relationship wore Carter down. And by the third year of the presidency during the hostage crisis, Zbig was beginning to win the arguments. And, you know, Zbig was the one who was constantly urging Carter to respond to the Iran hostage crisis with military force. And he was the one who persuaded Carter in the end, reluctantly to give a green light to the helicopter rescue mission, which of course turned out to be a disaster. And I think was preordained to be a disaster. It could never have succeeded, but Brzezinski was in favor of force. And, and it's ironic that it, over this issue, Cy Vance finally resigns at leaving Brzezinski um, standing on the field. And this is, I think, one of the tragedies of the Carter foreign policy apparatus. Mm. Uh, was there an October surprise <laughs> in 19... 80. We know there was a we, we know from the archives that it looks like there was an October surprise in 1968 involving the Nixon administration and um, with uh, dealing um, negotiations in, in Vietnam to force, you know, to force, you know, telling Vietnamese that 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 there's a better deal coming. Don't make a ceasefire uh, with the Johnson administration. 
um, there is a there are you've done a, a you've written a chapter here about about the issue of the Iranian hostage crisis. What did you find out, and how did, how should we think about the October surprise of 1980? Well, let me say that you know most good historians kind of shy away from conspiracy stories because most of them turn out not to be true. Um, so I, I approached this with some hesitation, but you know, some conspiracies are true. The conspiracy to assassinate Abraham Lincoln was a real conspiracy. And uh, the evidence about the so-called October surprise in 1980 comes down to one question. Did Ronald Reagan's campaign manager, William Casey, take a break in the summer of 1980, specifically in late July, fly to London for an academic conference on the OSS, where he had worked, you know, he was a veteran of the Office of Strategic Services and a great, you know, as a young man, he had his greatest experience is running covert operations in Europe during World War II. And, he loved the skullduggery of it all. And, and uh, so he had attended this. This is true. He did fly to London in late July for, to attend this academic conference. And it, he had a window of about three days uh, over the weekend. And that was enough time for him to take another flight into Madrid, Spain. And the allegation is that he went to Madrid that weekend and met with a representative of the Ayatollah Khomeini and engaged in some private diplomacy, specifically telling the Iranians that his candidate, Ronald Reagan, would be able to give them a better deal that they should not deal with Jimmy Carter. Well, this is like prolonging the hostage crisis if it happened. Well, there was a congressional investigation 10 years after Carter left the White House three years after Casey had died. And Congress couldn't come to a clear, you know, the evidence was muddied. Well, I, I found with the help of a, another journalist, uh, a White House memo that referred to a cable from the Madrid embassy reporting that, quote, Bill Casey is in town for purposes unknown. I think that's the smoking gun. It proves that Casey did go to Madrid that long weekend and spent a few hours negotiating with the Iranians, sending them a signal. And it's an out, if this is what happened, it's an outrageous example of, of interference and, and uh, in US foreign policy. And, uh, and it led to the prolonging of the hostage crisis. Uh, but Bill Casey was, uh, you know, exactly the kind of guy who was capable of doing that. <laughs> Casey, do you have uh, some questions? Or Carrie? Some yeah. questions um, that I will read out. So the first one is, Kai, what unique questions did you ask President Carter? Well, I asked him about the October surprise and he very diplomatically <laughs> Um, deferred, saying that he, he had no opinion about it. Uh, but he's a, he was clearly aware of the allegations and curious about what I would find. Um, I also asked him, as I explained, about Kerbo and his influence and thinking about various issues. And uh, I asked him about the helicopter rescue mission, uh, and you know he was he was helpful, but I have to say he the best thing he did to help his biographer was to keep a very detailed White House diary throughout his presidency. And of course, as you know, he published tw about twenty percent of it, uh, and it's a fabulous diary. It's substantive. It's a place where you can see him venting about various issues and personalities and problems he's facing on a daily basis. And uh, I asked him, uh, you know, repeatedly if he could open up the 80% that was still closed, but he turned me down and he's turned other historians down. 
but someday we're going to get access to that diary and I'm sure it's going to require yet another biography of Jimmy Carter. <laughs> Our next question is, Kai, you wrote a letter to Biden from Jimmy Carter's biographer uh, for The Nation magazine. What was the message you wanted to give President Biden? <laughs> well, that was sort of a tongue in cheek uh, article that I wrote for The Nation recently, uh, lessons that Biden could learn from Carter. And, you know, I, I sort of, in a joking manner, suggested that uh, he could learn from Carter not to attempt to bring peace to the Middle East between Israelis and Palestinians, because after all, uh, he should know from Carter's experience that the Israelis are more interested in building settlements in the West Bank than they are in ha having a peace or a two-state solution. Uh, I also ended the piece with uh, uh, sort of, again, tongue in cheek saying, if you ever find yourself uh, uh, in a pond fishing and you're suddenly attacked by a killer rabbit, don't try to hit it with an oar <laughs> because Americans love their rabbits even when they're swimming. <laughs> so, you know, it was, a, it was a funny piece, but I think actually seriously, Biden can actually learn a lot from the Carter presidency. Uh, and I think actually in a way, you know, they're, on the same page. Uh, Biden was uh, the first senator to endorse Carter in his 76 campaign, and they have a similar political beliefs and trajectories. And I think Carter, Carter's willingness to take political risks uh, and not to look at the politics of an issue and, and, and to try to simply do the right thing uh, is something that we're seeing Joe Biden trying to do now. So he's, uh, and he's at a stage, of course, in his long 40 plus political career, Biden is, where he can afford to take political risks without worrying about them. <laughs> so. so our next question is, your book is the latest in a series of reevaluations of President Carter. There have been three movies, Desert One, Rock and Roll President and Carter Land. Uh, in John Alter's book, His Very Best, and now your book. Do you see those changing the public public impression of President Carter? Yes, and there's also Stu Eisenstadt's mm -hmm. very long and wonderful book about the Carter presidency. Yeah, I think there's a, a, a reevaluation taking place in the same way that uh, <coughs> Americans took a second look at Harry Truman, who left office with uh, an approval rating of about 25% in 1952. And today he's sort of regarded as uh, a substantive president and uh, you know, people like the, the notion of Harry Truman. Uh, and I think the same, same process is taking place with the Carter presidency, uh, particularly because his records are largely open now, thanks to you guys in the presidential library, you archivists, um, and more papers are being declassified. And his diary, as I mentioned, is just a fabulous window onto the workings of the Oval Office. And uh, he, you know, he's a thoughtful, intelligent man, even to this day in his 90s. Yeah. And uh, I think people are, you know, they e easily recognize that he has done something really extraordinary with his long post-presidency, but there should be a realization that it's the same man and it's a seamless uh, story from the presidency to the ex-presidency. And this is one reason why I, my subtitle for the outlier is the unfinished presidency of Jimmy Carter, because I think he's like, you know, he used his, his ex-presidency to simply pursue many of the same issues that he was working on when he was in the Oval Office, Middle East peace, uh, health issues, et cetera. And, and it, it's, it's a very admirable and interesting and colorful record. So we have two more questions, which is about all we have time for. Uh, the, this, 
first of the two, uh, which is almost like a follow up to what we just had. Uh, he said, the questioner asked, you've interviewed President Carter several times. And after all his research, you probably understand how President Carter thinks. How important do you think it is that President Carter sees this reassessment now while he is alive? Well, he must be sitting back and uh, enjoying it in one level, on one level. But I know as a working biographer that uh, it's very hard to write a biography of a living person and have them uh, approve of it. <laughs> you know, biography is a very personal uh, thing. It's, uh, it's an art. It's not objective. It is filled with subjective decisions on what to put into the narrative and what to leave out. And I'm sure President Carter will read my book and recognize some, some of the stories and narratives and he'll scratch his head and, and have a long list of things that he, he wonders why, why did Kai Bird leave this out? <laughs> or he didn't understand this issue. So, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag, I'm sure, for him. He's, I'm sure. He's looking back and, and uh, in the painful position of having to read biographies about himself. <laughs> do you feel like there was a single tipping point for the Carter presidency, or do you see a series of events and circumstances that led to Carter's loss in 1980? Well, I, you know, a number of people that I interviewed uh, in the Carter administration told me that uh, Carter lost because of the three K's, Kennedy, Khomeini, and Koch. Ed Koch, the mayor of New York, who became a sort of thorn in his side. Uh, and it's true that Kennedy, by running against him, trying to seize the nomination from, from the Democratic Party from a sitting president, greatly weakened Carter. Even though, as Carter swore he was going to do, he, he whipped Kennedy's ass in <laughs> those primaries and uh, fought back. Uh, and kept the nomination, but he emerged weakened in his uh, for the general election fight with Ronald Reagan. And he was also greatly weakened by the hostage crisis. This was a very debilitating thing. And uh, it was psychologically draining because Carter became obsessed with the safety of the hostages. And he really didn't want to do anything to endanger their lives. And, you know, Cy Vance, the Secretary of State, kept telling him, reassuring him that, you know, diplomacy was going to eventually prevail and the hostages would be released when Khomeini no longer had any political reason to hold them. And uh, yet there was, you know, Brzezinski pushing him to use military force and to do the rescue mission, which failed. And then as even at the end of the general election in September and October, the negotiations were so close uh, that Carter believed that he had a real chance of bringing the hostages out, you know, in late September or early October, or even at the end of October. And people forget, you know, that election was a landslide for Reagan, but up until two weeks before the election, the polls were pretty close. Carter was within striking distance, within 5%, which is sort of, you know, the margin of error in many of these polls. And he really believed that he could still prevail over this B-rated B Hollywood movie actor and ex-governor of California. Uh, you know, he didn't, he didn't think that Reagan deserved the country or that the country deserved Ronald Reagan. And he was really quite devastated when he lost. So we had one last question kind of sneak in under the wire. It says, besides Carter, didn't the OPEC situation negatively impact other European governmental leaders? Well, yes, you know, the, uh, 
you know, Carter's presidency was bedeviled by stagflation, uh, high interest rates, inflation, uh, growing government deficits. And much of this was due to the energy crisis and the, uh, the jacking up of the price of oil in the Middle East in 1971 and then in 1973 due to the Arab oil boycott. And uh, that drove the inflation rates. And this was a worldwide phenomenon. So it, it impacted not only America, but uh, Europe and, and and much of the third world too. So yeah, it was a real problem. And Carter, Carter did everything he, you know, he, he tried everything he could to sort of combat inflation, um, but he couldn't control the price of oil. And uh, that's what was driving the inflation. And in the end, he again made a tough political decision uh, out of, desperation, I would argue, he appointed Paul Volcker as the new Fed chairman in uh, the late summer of 1979, no, over the opposition of all his political advisors who knew that Volcker was the kind of character who could uh, take a tough stance with the Fed and jack up interest rates even more in, in an effort to bring inflation down. And Carter knew the consequences of appointing Volcker, but he did it anyway, because everything else he had tried had failed. And indeed, Volcker did exactly what Carter's political advisors feared he would do. And uh, he began to jack up interest rates to, to a really high level, just as Carter was entering the general election campaign in 1980. And you know that was another reason for why he lost the November election. Uh, and he doesn't get credit. Ironically enough, most people think, seem to think that Ronald Reagan was the guy, the president who, with Volcker's help, uh, beat inflation. But it really started under Carter. Well, thank you for those thoughtful answers. And I would like to remind everyone that you can purchase Kai Bird's book at Acapella Books with a signed book plate. And um, thank you again, both to Kai and to Joe for this wonderful um, evening and this wonderful program. It'll be available, I believe, on the Acapella Facebook page. Um, and um, thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Joe.